uh, about the things to put in print that will be of great interest to today's Christians. And he has in print now, Earth's Earliest Ages, by George H. Pember. Give us a little bit of uh, insight into this book, why we should read it. And by the way, I have read it. Uh, I, I've been a fan of this book for a long time. And I think this might be the first time in a long time that George Hawkins Pembers, th- they consider this to be his magnum opus, right? The best thing he ever wrote, his masterpiece. Um, Earth's Earliest Ages. First time probably the unabridged version of it's been put back in print in over 130 years or since it was published. Mm-hmm. But the relevance of it, um, because he talks about some astonishing thing, including his belief that the final sign pointing to the arrival of Jesus Christ would be the, re- the return on earth of the Nephilim, the giants. What an astonishing concept, right? And, of course, that's a topic that uh, you ha- have been pursuing now for, with many authors for quite a while. You've written on the subject. Others have written on the subject. You've printed their books. And we're essentially talking about the prophecy made by our Lord that said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, meaning that that whole uh, horrific period before the flood would repeat itself in the last days. Yeah, Pember believed in cycles and ages, you know, uh, recreation and destruction and things like that. He was also a believer in the gap theory, which maybe we'll have time uh, to talk about during this interview. But this book is basically his analysis of Matthew 24. Uh, He saw things that were developing in his age, in the late 1700s, in the 1800s, into the early 1900s. For instance, theosophy, which is not a term you hear batted about much anymore. Uh, Helena Blavatsky, people like that, um, who claimed that they were receiving knowledge from old souls, old spirits. Well, Pember didn't doubt one bit that something very old was whispering this doctrine in their ears. And it reminded him very much, because if you look at theosophy, part of the idea was we will be able, through enlightenment science, we will be able to merge that with the spiritual aspects of man and find the keys to the knowledge of good and evil in which men would become as gods. And, you know, we forget, uh, and how quickly we forget, that in America, going back into the mid-19th century, ordinarily we think of things like the Civil War. And we think of the instabilities when, when this nation was in its, uh, in its youth and, and how men finally came to uh, a series of agreements which allowed our country to maintain stability, but we forget about the spiritual medium that was going on. Uh, at that time, in the mid 19th century, theosophy, the theosophical movement, the spiritist movement, people having seances, uh, uh, talking trumpets, uh, uh, cabinets where you could open the doors and protoplasm would flow out or whatever, ectoplasm, and all of this stuff was coming into uh, very, very uh, high visibility at the time Pember wrote his book. and. Pember, being a good Christian, said, wait a minute, I need to warn people about what this really is. He saw the danger in it. People would even be surprised to know that even here in the United States, even in the White House, seances were being conducted. People were communicating with the dead. So this this reached all the way through to the aristocracy here in the United States, also in Britain and around the world. Um, But Pember was very astute. And that when they talked about this promise that we could reach immortality through blendings, uh, scientific manipulation of man, we were going to create a new form of man. Well, he saw in this the same thing that had happened once before when the Nakash, right, the serpent, Mm -hmm. appeared in the garden and made the same promise to Eve. Oh, if you eat of this tree of knowledge and good and evil, you're not going to die. You're going to live forever. Now, Pember came to see uh, creative history, God's creative history, as cyclic in nature, that, that uh, there was a rise and fall of the fortunes of this created universe. And, and he saw it as having experienced a, a series of uh, zeniths, which then collapsed into desolation, followed by another zenith, and by the way, that's a biblical theme because the world starts out unformed and then it, 
uh, there is a, a, an earth created with Adam and Eve, and then at the end of the Bible, we have a new heavens and a new earth. So he was basically driving at an, at an old idea that God's creation is cyclical. It has its ups and downs for the purpose, uh, ultimately, of redemption. And that man somehow played a mysterious role often when we would cycle back into destruction, that God would lift up, he would create. Pember, um, Pember advocated what is also called the gap theory. Mm-hmm. He believed that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, And then between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis, there could have been eons. And this was, uh, in his day, of course, it was the challenge of the fossil record. What was people, you know, we're talking about geological evidence that the the earth couldn't possibly be only 7,000 years old. Well, he didn't see a problem with the idea at all that God had originally created heaven and earth. And then it somehow had cycled down. And, And he talks about this. What happened? What happened that caused darkness and chaos to settle upon the earth? Mm -hmm. And then here comes God, and he recreates. He's got Adam and Eve. Now God's creating again. The earth is better. And then what happens? Something happens. The watchers come down. Fallen angels come down. The Nephilim are born out of that. And he saw in the 19th century that man was tracking along this same pathway once again that we were going to try to use technology. Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, some of his contemporaries at that time, spoke about man. Uh, Nietzsche talked about man as a rope tied between the ancient primal savage, the ape man, but the over man, the uber mentioned, the superman that he could become, and that we were going to do this through science, the science of that day, of course, mostly being eugenics, which Hitler tried to use. He was a devotee, a theosophist, Mm -hmm. the Thule Society that brought him to power, theosophist, who thought they would use science to create a new form of humanity. And Pember was very intelligent, ahead of the game, really, in seeing the danger. You know, uh, Pember takes note of uh, this from Isaiah, uh, chapter 46, verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And Pember essentially says the Lord takes the earth through cycles. And these cycles of rising and falling, uh, from our perspective, we say, well, that's that's not good. You know, it would be nice if the earth were just stable and everything was blessed and, you know, we didn't have bad storms and death and all and corruption and so forth. But Pember really picks up and magnifies the idea that God has a purpose in this uh, series of cycles. And, and Pember even goes for, forward, and by the way, he's writing in the mid-19th century, he goes forward and writes about the coming of the Antichrist with, I think, some very effective ideas. Yet yeah, very effective, and it's interesting that uh, Pember was a member of the Plymouth Brethren. These were early forerunners of what we would call dispensationalists uh, today. They were premillennial. Uh, they were. And this, you know, 150 years ago, Uh, And uh, so his theology, when you're reading in this book, Earth's Earliest Ages, you can't help but notice some of the brilliant theological uh, essay that he creates in here for that argument. And Pember, from the position that he wrote back in the mid-19th century, looked forward and saw this outbreak of, of the power of fallen angels, which he said would explode in the latter days. Basically, he's making the argument for the eminency of the return of Jesus Christ. That's right. And yet he doesn't go too far. He's not like, uh, you know, some of the people lately in the last few years who have been setting dates right. for when Jesus would be here. Uh, in fact, he analyzed the uh, 24th chapter of the book of Matthew, and he, and he basically categorized it into seven great signs. But the final sign, he said, has not yet arrived, but we're moving towards it. Uh, man has got himself back on the same path once again, that is going to allow for the return of the Nephilim. You, you, you read a text. Let me read one. Okay, good. Here's what he says. Uh, the influences of the Spirit of God are even now, now he's talking about his day, yeah. are even now in process of withdrawal as he prepares for that departure from earth which will leave it open for Nephilim. And then there is just literally going to be an explosion that is going to rush in with the return of the Nephilim. And look at what he says. Sevenfold worse. 
than those who formerly dwelt in it to enter and for a short season to work their will upon the human race. Wow. So not only are the giants coming back, it's going to be seven times worse than it was in the antediluvian na- age. Hmm. So far ahead of his time, it's hard to believe. Now, though this book was written in the 19th century, uh, it's not laden with a lot of heavy language. So I, I want to remove that caution right away. A lot of times you, you know, there are books written back in the 19th century, and you know, oh, you can't even wade through them because the language is a little bit, uh, shall we say, belabored. But this book flows right along. And you know what I like about this book, Tom? It, it is that that Pember cites historical authority, going all the way back to the Greek writers, Plato and Hesiod and all the the Greeks who made comments about the subject of fallen angels and demons. And then he brings all of that, uh, of those Greek ideas forward into his own time and, and into our time. It makes a lot of sense. In other words, Uh, the things that the Greeks and the Romans wrote about from their perspective as pagans really did happen, says Pember. Yeah, and he, for instance, he quotes Hesiod in here, um, and he points out how Hesiod describes what we would describe in biblical history as the watchers who came down, married to women, out of them are born the mighty men of old, these mutant or hybrid forms of human, which eventually are destroyed in the flood and swept under the mountains, according to some of the ancient texts. Uh, And he he shows how Hesiod tells exactly the same story from his own Greek and mythological, but, but Hesiod turns it for the pagans, and he says that these spirits that are now under the earth are demons, but they're good. And they work on behalf of mankind. Right. And what Pember was saying is if you look at what a theosophist like Helena Blavatsky was saying about these old spirits that are going to help man, they're going to take us. And, and they even use language like we're going to see a new golden age. Right. Blavatsky mm-hmm. wrote about that. Well, anybody yeah. that knows Greek mythology knows that they believed in four ages and that this final golden age would be when the god Apollo, the Antichrist, according to the New Testament, returns on earth. So Pember was, uh, he was extraordinary in being able to uh, envision how what the theosophists, the spiritualists, what they were saying and what they were marrying themselves to was a trick that seems like it has worked over and over again, beginning, of course, with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Amazing how things repeat themselves. And so here's George Pember in the 19th century writing things, warning his generation about things that we should know about. And quite frankly, they're not taught as widely as they should be taught, particularly in churches uh, where prophecy is shunned for the most part these days uh, in the institutional church. And certainly a subject like this one, Earth's earliest ages, uh, is never spoken of. And yet this will fill so many gaps in your understanding of prophetic Scripture. We're making this available. Tom has uh, taken Pember's work and reprinted it. It's in a in a beautiful uh, uh, form, easy to read. I love the typeface that he chose, uh, and you'll love to read it. Earth's Earliest Ages by G. H. Pember. Uh, the ideas that were flowing profusely in Pember's day, in Darby's day, and on into the days of the great missionary movements, the the days when uh, C.I. Schofield, for example, uh, in 1909, a little bit later on, there was about a 50-year period in there from the mid-19th century to the early 20th when uh, uh, amazing things were happening in the world of Bible understanding. Yeah, and I've often thought that as much as I appreciate the, um, you know, the information age, the information highway, the Internet... Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that information is so easy that I can go to Google and type in some remnant of a verse, I don't have to really remember anymore right. where it was at in the Bible. Uh, I can find it online like that and go, oh, yeah, that was in Jeremiah, the fourth chapter or whatever. These guys lived at not such a time. Yeah. They had to be students of the Word from Genesis to Revelation, and they committed a great deal to memory, and they didn't have as many distractions on their time as we have today, which is really kind of a trap. Yeah, no radio. 
Uh, let's face it, no electric lights. You'd read by candlelight or, or lamplight, and things were quiet. Men were studious. They wrote in compound sentences that actually said something. And I love this, this uh, book by George Pember, have for years, and by the way, I've, I have to confess, I have a very old copy, and basically it was out of print until Tom came along and brought it back, and he's brought it back for people like you who are interested not only in Bible prophecy, but in going a step farther in into the understanding of God's redemptive process, the fall of Satan the collapse of planet Earth, the restructuring of planet Earth, the, the new heavens and the new Earth. All of these are things, subjects that interested Pember. Right. Now you could, you could move forward to the future because central to this book is Pember's argument that both the spirit of the Nephilim was at work in his day, but he prophesied the literal return on Earth of what we would think of as mutants, hybrid forms of humanity that can be incarnated by demonic spirits. And you know, we just came from the Branson Conference, uh, July, uh, and all throughout that conference, speaker after speaker and person after person, this seemed to be the buzz that was at the Branson Conference, more and more people wanting to know, um, was Pember right? Is there evidence to suggest that there will be a literal return of the Nephilim. Mm-hmm. But here's, here's kind of the, the, the deeper malevolent question people were asking. Are they here now? Yes. Are there hybrid forms of humans that are something demonic that are walking among mankind? And it was amazing how many people were asking that question. In fact, that became the predominant theme at Branson. And all of the speakers focused in some way around that theme. Now, they were not coached to do so. No one declared the theme. It, it just sort of happened. And, and that's, that's because I believe it's quite relevant. I believe the Spirit of the Lord is leading us to understand this right now. And Pember understood it in the mid-19th century that in the latter days there would be an incursion of fallen creatures uh, back into the society of man. And that out of that would come the Antichrist, the reign of the Antichrist, whom he envisioned as a man fully possessed by uh, the spirit of Satan. And one thing we pointed out that most Americans are unaware of is that the prophecy that is on the great seal of the United States of America, Mm -hmm. the Novus Ordo Seclorum, is taken from the Kume Sibyl who did predict that at the end of time, this new golden age that Blavatsky and others were writing about, it would happen, but it would dawn at the return of the god Apollo uh, and these deities that Blavatsky saw as, as positive ancient spirits, but that Pember saw as the return of the demonic uh, yeah. that would be manifested in various ways uh, in flesh on earth. And his book starts out with a series of warnings against this. He was very conscious of it. And he wanted to warn Christians at that time that this was happening. Then he looked forward and said, now here's what should unfold. Well, lo and behold, Tom, it's it's unfolding right now. Yeah, that's exactly right. And think of this. The reason I brought this up, Gary, I was thinking about this before we went on the air. I went on the the, uh, show here. How many Americans are aware? Think, wrap your mind around this thought, ladies and gentlemen that the average American, we carry on our person more often than we carry the Word of God or the promises of the return of Jesus Christ. We carry in our wallets and in our person the the prophecy of and the invocation Mm. for the coming of the Antichrist. That's right. Now, have we been duped? The dollar, you know, that's still, it, it, it may not much longer, but right now it remains the monetary uh, you know, it's on which our, the international monetary system is based. Think about that, and think about the the old Jews, uh, and t- t- today even the Orthodox Jews, who will not bind on their person uh, anything but like Scripture. Their their prayer shawls have beads that remind them of certain psalms and certain mm-hmm. promises that are in the Scripture. Remember uh, uh, how they would plug their ears. They wouldn't allow themselves to hear through the ear gate something that could affect the soul that might be blasphemous. They wouldn't let their eyes 
look upon anything that would be blasphemous. And here today, Americans, more often than we carry on our person the promise of the return of Jesus Christ, we carry the invocation for the coming of the Antichrist in a prophecy that is on the great seal of the United States on our $1 bill. Now, Pember tracked all of this back to the fall of Satan. <clears throat> and I have to be right up front with you, Pember's thesis began with a collapse of this planetary system prior to the creation of Adam and Eve. Now, he was not alone in all this. The Plymouth Brethren, uh, the great uh, Schofield Bible of 1909, the Schofield Notes included uh, a, an acknowledgment of this idea that perhaps there was a prior creation uh, which collapsed this planet in, in sin, and, and the Lord's uh, creation of the world in Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 was perhaps a recreation. If you want to read about these ideas uh, from his perspective, from a perspective of uh, the Plymouth Brethren and those uh, teaching the Bible going up into the late 19th, early 20th century, this is an excellent uh, book that will introduce you to the idea. Yeah, and of course, um, the early church fathers, uh, all the way up through the first century, would have agreed with much, or maybe even most, of what Pember writes. They, right. too, believed that the watchers came down, that th what today we call the angel theory, that this first uh, uh, Helena Blavatsky movement had actually happened once before. That was the common belief among the Christians in the early church. Uh, Athenagoras wrote about it in 177 A.D. We saw in the, in the Qumran text the Dead Sea Scrolls support. So... It's not like he had come up with a novel idea, but um, uh, he saw something deeper in it that started. Something in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century started. And by the way, Pember, though he lived, what, 150 plus years ago, it was of the same mind. He was a pioneer, just like Darby, just like Schofield, all of those men who created this incredible uh, Bible study movement that set the tone for the 20th century, and it laid the foundation for men like Hal Lindsey, who would come along in 1970, the, the, the late great planet Earth. Uh, all of the, uh, the Bible study that we're doing today uh, really goes back to this great fertile explosion of Bible study in the late 19th century, and you owe it to yourself to just check the book out. Let me hold it up again while we're talking about it. It's called Earth's Earliest Ages by G.H. Pember. I believe when you begin to read this, it's really going to be exciting to you. As it was to me the first time I ever read this book, I just absolutely devoured it. I mean, and I, I know you have too. It's It's got some wonderful thoughts in it. By the way, it's written by a devout Christian. Pember uh, reveals himself in these pages to be a man uh, uh, who is a uh, a fer fervent follower of Christ. Well, Tom, we're down to a minute. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, but this has been so much fun to be with you, uh, Gary, to talk about this today. There's so much more we could have talked about. Oh, yeah. You could do whole shows, by the way, just on the gap theory and some of these things that we've only vaguely uh, mentioned here. I know you've done a lot of research on the long story of Satan, Absolutely. Uh, well, you know, Satan, in my opinion, uh, represents original sin, uh, which I know is a, a topic it's, it's very late to start talking about, <laughs> but, but I believe that his sin preceded uh, the sin of, of Adam and Eve and, 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 and set off a whole chain of events, the repercussions of which we are still experiencing today. And that's basically what Pember talked about. Right. Tom, come again. It's, it's always fun talking to you. And the book is Earth's Earliest Ages by G. H. Pember. You'll love it. Uh, you will be, uh, I think, stimulated to other Bible study uh, when you begin to uh, engross yourself in some of Pember's very well thought out, deep ideas. Well, our time has come to a close. Sorry we have to leave. I'm Gary Stearman. 